Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. So I apologize. I had a appointment today that I was supposed to make and it actually did take place, but I was able to get over it real quick and then run back to the church here. And so we're going to go ahead and continue on with our Devo 30 and hopefully we'll get a few people on. I know that you were not expecting me to be on today, but I am on today. And we stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And if you're in the neighborhood, you'd love to join us here. You're more than welcome to join us. You can look us up at uh, ccinland.org. ccinland.org. And today we're beginning a new letter in 2 Thessalonians, written by the Apostle Paul. So let's go ahead and pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for, for opening up, Lord, this possibility to just Dig into the Word again, Lord. And as we go through it, Father, uh, letter by letter, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, Lord, may you minister to us right where we're at, Lord. And Father, may it be your Holy Spirit, <clears throat> Father, that reveals all truth to our hearts, Lord. And Lord, may it um, change us from the inside out, Father. Let us receive it, accept it, believe it, and apply it to our lives, Lord, that we may continue to have blessed lives, Jesus. We thank you for today, Lord, and beginning our day with, with you and your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so let's look at 2 Thessalonians. Open up your Bibles. Um, real quick, just give you a little survey of the book. Paul is still dealing with, with some um, <clears throat> issues that are being pushed within the church itself by false teachers. False teachers. You will always have false teachers, just like you did uh, during the time of Jesus and the Apostle Paul. In fact, most of the letters that are written in the Bible are due to the fact that these false teachers had come into the church and have told lies and confused the body of Christ and Paul having to <laughs> correct them of these false things. And so nothing new here with the Thessalonians. You know that we dealt with uh, the issue of Jesus' return in chapter 1, and they're still at it. Today, you know, it's interesting when you look at some of the false teaching that's out there. If you were to do a, a, a survey of each of the false teachings, you can actually trace them back all the way to the times of Paul. And they just, they resurface here and there, but with different names. Because the enemy doesn't have a whole lot of ammunition. Uh, tells the same lie over and over again. But normally he calls it something else. You know, so calls it either Reformed theology, you know, or replacement theology. And these are theologies that are out there that are, that are false, um, that are not true. And um, Paul has to deal with those, those theologies um, in different churches. And so we see that um, even today taking place. So that's why it's so important to know your Bible, right? Know what the Bible teaches. Read it. Study it and uh, you won't be deceived by those um, within the church. And they are within the church, unfortunately. They come into the church, they pretend like they're believers, and they may be believers uh, to a certain degree, but then they have their, their different views on different doctrines, and for whatever reason, they, they really hold on to them and um, want everyone else to believe it too. So Paul is dealing with that. He's writing to the Corinth to the Thessalonians here from Corinthian around AD 51. So he's encouraging them, explaining the day of the Lord, which you'll get in more detail in chapter 2, and exhorting the church. Encouraging encouragement during persecution is always good for us to do. When a brother or sister is being persecuted, we should encourage them. We should be there for them. Uh, whether it's financially or whether it's through prayer, or whether it's through support of some sort, um, just being there for them. And it's also good to explain things to uh, one another, why we believe what we believe, why we do the things that we do, uh, why the Bible says this or that, you know. So explanation is good, and every pastor should be able to give you an explanation uh, for the word. And then, of course, the exhortation to the body of Christ through the old church. So let's go ahead and get into chapter one. It's a short chapter. So we may be done a little early. But Paul introduces himself here. Paul, uh, Salvanus, and Timothy. Uh, Timothy was Paul's 
companion, young companion, uh, protege, and he poured his heart into Timothy, uh, teaching him as much as he could, and Timothy ended up uh, becoming a pastor uh, of a church, and Timothy learned a lot through the Apostle Paul, and we'll be getting to his letters here real soon. And he writes to the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so interesting that he says the church. Now that word church again is where the people are gathering in a building. That's what it's saying here. To the people who are gathering in the building there in Thessalonica, uh, in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So important that when you read these epistles that you see that they're always uh, beginning with that sense that this is the church that belongs to God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, who is the one leading and, and guiding them. So you have that trinity and that relationship that God has with us. It, it's not to the church in Thessalonica uh, in the Mormon church or the Jehovah Witness church or you know these other churches that are out there. No, it's in God alone, the, who is the Father, and through Jesus Christ. There are no no names or denominations in heaven. Yeah. You know, it, it's going to be just the Lord in you in the end. We all stand before him and he will judge us all in our faithfulness. It says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we are bound, we are bound, <clears throat> which means uh, uh, to owe in a sense. In other words, we, we owe we owe it to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other. So if you're a church, that's what you want to be known for, right? Is your love and your faith in Jesus Christ. And I think that when you come to our church, you will really experience that. Mm -hmm. If you haven't been to our church, I think you should at least come visit if you don't have a church. You're looking for one. You should at least come and visit, and you should be open to what the Lord is doing here. I had someone recently tell me that the Lord laid it on their hearts to come here specifically. And the reason that they came here specifically is because they see us doing the work that Jesus would have done. They're, we're on the ground. We're hands-on. We're actually trying to make a difference in our community. We're not just a big building with with entertainment and light shows just entertaining people coming in and then them leaving but we are literally trying to make a difference in our community and if you come here you'll see you'll see some homeless you'll see people without jobs you'll see people lined up outside sitting in the courtyard who are waiting to receive groceries but they're also hearing the gospel message and we're pouring into them some of them that will be here for you know maybe a month's time and then all of a sudden they're back on their feet and we probably won't see them I remember just, what, a couple, two, three weeks ago, a young man uh, was here for some food for his family, and he sat through the message, and afterwards he, he came to me, he says, you spoke to me. That person was me. And he said, I don't know what to do. I, I, I need Jesus. I need to surrender my life. And so I led him to the Lord. And so this is what's happening in our church. Almost every Sunday, we're seeing people changed and coming to the Lord. Um, this last week, several people came to the Lord. Yeah. And so God is just moving. So I encourage you, if you're looking for a church and you want a church that's actually active, yeah. you know, and doing something, then this is the church to go to. If you're a person that just wants to sit in the pews and do nothing, then this isn't the church to go to. Because I think that, uh, I think that because of the size of our church, I think you'll feel convicted. I think you will. You'll sit there and you'll leave and then you'll come back and you'll go, I'm not really doing much. And I don't really have a desire to do much. Well, there's a problem there, first of all, because every believer should be serving the Lord. Yeah. And, and so you'll start feeling convicted like, oh boy, every time I come there and I see people serving and doing things and here I am not you know, doing anything. And, and people are just into their lives. They're into their own lives and that's it. I went to my chiropractor uh, last week and I said, I'm going to be coming to you probably every three, maybe four weeks until I go to South Sudan. He goes, ooh, South Sudan. And he goes, I'm not going. And I'm like, oh, you don't want to go? Come on, come with me. It would be great to have you there. He goes, no, 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 no. I want to stay here in the United States where it's safe. A lot of stuff is going on. Oh, there's only hippos over there and crocodiles and alligators and there's civil war and, you know, and all of this stuff. And, and he's like, no, I'm, I'm fine here. And so we were kind of joking about it. And um, I said, you should support me. 
And he goes, no, I have to support my family, you know? And, and, I, and I caught that right away. And it's like, that's the mentality, right? Let us just be concerned about my own personal family and not anyone outside of that. And then he shared some things about what's going on in his family. And I told him I'd be praying for, for his family. But that is truly uh, a lot of people. You know, no, I don't go outside my own walls. Yeah. You know, I'm going to stay within my walls and use all my resources for my own family. But that's not what God teaches us. He teaches us to go outside that. It's better to give than to receive. Now, well, I'm giving to my children. or to Yeah, but outside of that, the church is supposed to do that. And so there's those people that have that, that mentality not to give outside. And they're stuck there because they're really not going to go anywhere. It's when you start serving that God begins to move in your life and bring so much uh, great teaching to your heart. There's change, there's attitude, um, adjustments, and God is just so good at doing that. So this church is the Church of Jesus Christ, and they have love, and their faith is growing. And Paul says, man, I, I owe it to you to pray, to pray always for you because you're doing so much in all that you're abounding towards one another. Now, he didn't say towards your family. He said towards the brethren, the other believers, too. Uh, I think uh, somewhere else Paul said, you know, do good, especially for those of the household, that is, those that are believers in the church. So he goes on, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So this is common in all the churches, persecution and tribulations. You'll always have persecution and tribulations happening in church. I think that if you're a church that is doing God's will, that there will be persecutions and tribulations or afflictions happening from the outside and even from the inside. You look at the life of Jesus and you see the afflictions that the apostles caused him at that time, the disciples, right? Always murmuring, always complaining, always bickering against each other, even getting their moms involved. Hey, mom, go see if I'll sit at his right hand or his left hand, wanting to position <laughs> themselves, you know, and, and so forth. And, and then you have Judas Iscariot, you know, who was uh, kind of behind the scenes, and he was literally, he was literally planning and scheming you know, to do harm uh, to Jesus Christ. And ultimately, he, he betrayed him. And so if Jesus is going to go through it, and I think it's a sign of a healthy church uh, that uh, there is persecutions and tribulations that we need to endure through. He goes on, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. So God is our uh, defender. We need to leave things to God. We're going to see tonight, if, if you're in the area and you love to come to church tonight, we're going to be looking at Numbers chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at the family, I themed it uh, family feud. So Moses, Aaron, and Miriam are going to be in a little debate but you'll notice something about Moses, that as these things are going on, the accusations from Miriam and then Aaron supporting her, um, <clears throat> Moses never says a word. He never defends himself. He never tries to correct them. He just leaves them to God. And then it was God who all of a sudden comes into the scene and says, you don't know what you two are talking about because I have chosen Moses. You have not chosen. And I have the right to choose who I want to choose to put in leadership. You know, because they were... They were saying, well, he's married to this woman, bad judgment. He's also a prophet, but we're prophets too, and we can prophesy just like he can prophesy. So, you know, he doesn't have anything we don't have. The only thing he has is that God chose him for that position. And so God actually came in and gave leprosy to Miriam. Uh, so God did that work. And so in the end, uh, they were so repentive in a sense because they got caught. And they realized they were wrong. And so Aaron came to Moses, kind of like a mediator, and said, Moses, please pray for your sister, Miriam. Could you please? And then he prayed. He opens his mouth and asks the Lord to, to heal her. Those are the only words that we see Moses say. So he never defended himself. He never said anything. But he prayed for his enemies. He prayed for those who were persecuting him. You know, so that says a lot about Moses. So when he says that he was the, the meekest man, you know, the humblest, he definitely was but he wasn't always was he uh -uh. so he had to learn those things through trials and so forth so we're going to see that tonight in more detail so i encourage you to
to be here tonight or watch us on Facebook Live. <clears throat> Uh, since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's referring now to the second coming, not the rapture, but the second coming of God that there's a judgment coming, and God will bring vengeance upon the unbelieving world. Right now, he has grace, and we should, too, have grace upon the unbelieving world and hopefully share the gospel with them that they may repent. Now, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now, interesting because this is everlasting destruction because there's this theology, this teaching, false theology, that, that hell is temporary. That how can a loving, caring God send people to hell for eternity, right? How can a God do that? Well, he's a just and righteous God. That's how. <coughs> and if he wasn't, then <coughs> it wouldn't be a God to worship because there's limitation there. So God isn't sending us to hell, by the way. We choose to go to hell because he's already paved the way. He's given us the answer. He's given us a solution. All you simply need to do is receive Jesus Christ into your heart and you'll be saved. You'll go to heaven. But we choose not to accept that. So what does he do? You'll be separated from the Lord, he says here. Now that's interesting because all of that ties into God's heart. Division is separation, right? When we look at tonight's study, we're going to see that these two are dividing Moses against God. They're trying to separate Moses and God. They're trying to say, God, you need to use us and not Moses. Moses is no good. That's division, that's separation. Uh, God says that he hates divorce. Divorce is separation, it divides a, a family, it divides a husband and a wife, and then it divides the children from parents, because then you see parents who start bad-mouthing the other spouse, you know, and trying to get the kids to hate them too, which is despicable for them to even do. Uh, so you see the separation. Then you see Jesus on the cross, and, and he's saying, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And so there's a separation that he uh, feels and it's in his very fiber, always being in unity and in one with God and all of a sudden separated from God. So you know God's heart hates separation and division. That's why he says, I hate divorce. That's why Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that's why he's saying here that when you decide to not choose me, then you will be separated for eternity from me. You'll get your you'll get your answer to your request. If you don't want me now while on earth, then you won't have me in heaven either. And it will be too late and you will be separated for eternity. So this separation is something that's interesting to look at in the Bible. It's not what God really wants. And Jesus doesn't want to separate the unbelievers. He wants them to repent. The Bible says that uh, God wishes that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance and be saved. That's God's heart, is that everyone would be saved. He wants to see them repent from their sins, but that's their choice, free will. And so he hates separation. And here we see this separation, everlasting destructions from the presence of who? The Lord himself. So in a sense, he's going to divorce. He's going to divorce the unbeliever completely from him. Now, when he comes in that day to be glorified, in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony testimony among you uh, was believed. Now, isn't that interesting? Admired. The word can mean wonder or marveled or be astonished. That's something that's going to happen in heaven. We were talking about heaven last night. That's going to happen in heaven. We're going to stand there before Jesus and God and we're going to marvel. We're going to go, wow. We're going to be in wonder. You know, we're going to be astonished when we see all that's there beyond our understanding. Therefore, we also <laughs> pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of, his, of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasures of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Now, he's encouraging the whole church here, by the way. Remember that. He's saying, look, I'm praying that God will count you worthy of your calling, of your separation. 
taking you from the world and putting you into the family of God and doing his good pleasure, not yours, but doing what he wants you to do. Uh, his goodness, his work of faith and power. What work? Work of faith and power. It's a work of faith. Now, let me talk about this just for a second because this is interesting. How is God going to judge believers? Well, he's going to judge us at the, at the Bema seat of Christ. and He's going to judge us by our works. But not necessarily by our works, but by our, but by our faithfulness. Yes. He's going to judge us by our faithfulness. So he's not judging each one of us about by how much work we have done. Because you can get a guy doing a lot of work in a small church or even in a big church. You know, those that are leading these churches, they all have the same day. 24 hours. Each of them have 24 hours in a day. And they all have different ministries and they all do different things and they can all be just as busy as the other one. So God isn't going to necessarily uh, judge on how many things you're doing throughout the day. He's going to judge on how faithful you are. So if you're a pastor of a small church, he's going to judge you on how faithful you are in that small church to those people and leading and guiding them to Jesus Christ. You know, what you're doing with that ministry, that call. Um, if you're a pastor of a bigger church, you're no different than the guy in the small church. You're going to be judged on your faithfulness to the bigger church and what you do and how you lead them. So God judges on faithfulness. If you are in the body of Christ and you have a certain ministry, he's not going to judge you because your ministry is better than someone else's ministry. He's going to judge you on how faithful you are to that ministry. And he will judge all of us on our faithfulness of what he gives us. So this is interesting. Because now you can have a pastor who's not faithful to his ministry, and then you can have a person that comes into church, and he opens up the church, he cleans everything, he sets everything, and he's faithful for 30 years, and the Lord takes him home. Which one is going to be rewarded more? That one guy. More than the pastor. Because he was faithful in doing what God had called him to do. Yeah, but what he did wasn't that important. Yes, it was. In God's eyes, he doesn't see it as important or not. He sees the faithfulness of his heart his heart. Um, perseverance is a part of being faithful. Uh, <clears throat> no matter what happens around you, you still do it. No matter if people leave, you still do it because God has called you to do that. He didn't call you to do it if people stay, if things go the way you want, if you have the resources. He didn't call you. He just said, be faithful with it. That's what faithfulness is. It means suffering through persecution. So even as you're suffering through persecution, you continue to do it. Um, I remember watching uh, someone going on a missions trip, and in the background I could see a person in a wheelchair and with a neck brace, and I thought, wow. So they must be in pain. They're in a wheelchair, but still they wanted to serve the Lord. And, and it just brings back memories to me when I first got my injury, and how I would get up at the pulpit, and the church was so gracious at the time. Uh, not that it's gracious now, but it's gracious. Uh, they put a chair, a nice comfortable chair, like a, a nice uh, Amor chair. And I'd sit on it with my foot up because I had ruptured my Achilles tendon. And I would teach from their sitting. And, and so it was cool because they would all set that up while we were all introducing ourselves and saying hi to people. And then I'd get up there and I'd teach. And then as soon as I was done, I'd go home and just lay in bed again. And I did that for at least a couple of years while I was injured. Was I in pain? Yes, I was in pain. But God called me to pastor here. And so I did that. Could I have maybe asked someone else to do it? Yeah, I probably could have. But I would have just been in laying in bed in pain. So why not be here teaching in pain? then you become faithful to what God has given to you. So it's persevering through those things. And God's going to judge us on our faithfulness. That the name, verse 12 to end, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the grace that God gives us. And he gives each one of us abundance of grace. It's unmeasurable and it, it, it never is exhausted. He has always given us grace. So do as much as you can through the grace of God and be faithful with what he gives you and you'll be blessed. <clears throat> so Paul's now setting up you know, the stages for chapter two and he's gonna talk about the day of the Lord. And that will be on Friday when we talk about the Lord's return. That's exciting. So God bless you guys. Um, thank you for joining us. I know short notice, not 
too many were here because of uh, the situation, but I appreciate it. If you have any prayer requests, please post them and, and we'll pray for you as we're praying here. Let's go ahead and pray to close. Father in heaven, we pray that you just guide us and lead us today, Lord. Number our steps, Father. And help us, Lord, to be faithful with what we need to do today, Lord. Just today, not worry about tomorrow. Not even worry about what happened uh, yesterday, Lord. That's gone. We can't get it back. Let's just move forward uh, to, to through today, Lord. And let us glorify you, Father, in everything that we do. I pray you bless your people. Encourage them. Strengthen them. Heal them, Lord, if they're sick. Meet their financial needs, Father. And just let them abound, Lord, in their faith and in their love for one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you tonight.